Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Dujabauer. I'm sure you've heard the saying, happy wife, happy life. But is it true? Is it biblical? Well, my guests today are diving headfirst into what it means to be a wife, both theologically and vocationally speaking. And we'll get to talk about how women who live by God's design in their marriage lead beautiful and abundant lives, and those around them are probably happier for it. Deaconess Rosie Adel and Rebecca Curtis are my guests today, and they also happen to be sisters. Ladies, welcome. Would you please introduce yourselves? This is Rebecca. I'm the big sister, so I get to go first. I am a, I usually put in my bio that I am a housewife, school mom, and church lady. That is what I do full time. As a hobby, I do some writing and um, some more boring word related tasks. But in general, I am home for my husband, my kids, and my neighbors, which especially includes um, the church, churches my husband serves, and the schools my kids attend. Didn't you recently bake a bunch of pies for your church? Oh, that is true. Uh, we ha- My church has a very large sausage supper on the last Sunday of October every year, which is kind of sad for us because it, the effect is that we're not a very Reformation conscious congregation because everyone is uh, slinging sausages like crazy people that day. We have more people in our sausage supper than we do in our town, and um, it's a very big event. And yeah, I'm on the hook for a lot of pies for that. So uh, relieved to be to have that behind me for another 51 weeks. I've, the countdown begins. Yep. <laughs> hey, Rosie, you. Hi, I'm Rosie. I'm Rebecca's little sister, and we do have a lot of things in common. I'm also a wife. We have uh, six kids. We live in Imperial, Nebraska. We haven't lived here very long. We moved here in July. My husband is a pastor at Zion Lutheran, and I am at home, but also very busy with lots of different activities related to family life and church life. I also help teach online classes for distance deaconess students of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. How long has it been since you both have lived in the same town? We lived really close for a long time, and it was great. (laughs) We lived um, just about 20 miles from each other. She was in Warden, Illinois, and I was in Collinsville, Illinois, and we had that set up for over eight years, and it was amazing. But now we live 12 hours apart, but we make up for it by talking on the phone nonstop. It helps a lot. Yeah. (laughs) You ladies are a fun crew, and you've also written a book together. Tell us quickly about that. Ladylike is a collection of essays we wrote uh, for Concordia Publishing House. It was published in 2015, and it covers all kinds of topics that are relevant in the lives of women. Some of them are more abstract and some are more practical. Um, And our goal with the book was really just to answer a lot of the questions that women find themselves asking because the times in which we live don't answer a lot of those questions directly or they answer them directly, but not in a way that accords well with scripture or with uh, the life of the church. And um, our intention was to get at those questions in a way that was accessible, thoughtful, and deals with those ideas that are just kind of hanging around in the air that surrounds us without a lot of willingness to speak to them all the time, because they do get pretty difficult and awkward because the church's answers and scripture's answers are not answers to which our culture is favorably inclined. But we also know that ladies don't have a lot of time to sit around reading books and the essay format allowed us to kind of do precision targeting of topics that we thought uh, were were the ones people were asking about and to deal with them briefly. um, But also again, with thought and um, bringing in a lot of ideas from scripture and from wise people to inform the answers that we think are useful to the women of God. 
It worked that we structured it as a collection of essays because we could both be working on kind of our own timeline and our own subjects that we are focusing on. And so the collaborating was just saying, I'm writing on this. Okay, cool. You got that. And going back and forth in that way worked really well for co-authoring a book. Um, the funny thing was after we completed, you know, Rebecca finished her her essays and I finished mine and we compiled them all, organized them and submitted them. And Concordia Publishing House responded to us and said, this is great, but could you write an essay that's actually specifically about how a wife regards and relates to her husband? And we both said, oh, did we not do that? <laughs> and we kind of hadn't. And so that was the one uh, topic that Concordia Publishing House came back to us and said, we need, you know, kind of a definitive word on that. And so we added that last essay. I think that was the only thing that they said, hey, there's something missing from your book. And it was that subject. And so maybe those are some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And it was kind of amusing that both of us recognized, oh, yeah, I didn't write that, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> but it's in there now. We took care of adding it. So it's in the book now. Just probably so second nature to you. So it's like, well, just assume that everybody knows what, what the deal is with this. I would agree with Rebecca, though, that these essays are accessible, they're thoughtful, and they are a huge blessing to the reader. So since you both are, as you call it, word sleuths, because you are authors and instructors and, and mothers. You're very good with words. What do you think about that old quip? Happy wife, happy life. Does it have you roll in your eyes? It rhymes, so that makes it useful. You know, it's one of those things where it's both true and not true. Of course, if you're around a happy person, they're easier to live with. They're more agreeable. They're more inclined to you know, just be good company and uh, work a little harder and be generally more willing. And of course, that's easier to live with. On the other hand, happiness is not a prerequisite for obedience for any Christian. So to that extent, thinking that you can improve your life by accommodating a wife's demands or doing everything you can to make her happy, well, that's not going to work either. Um, happiness is is not something that a person arrives at after a set of conditions are reached or, you know, requests are fulfilled. So sure, uh, a guy whose wife is happy is probably going to come home to a more pleasant environment. That doesn't mean that an unhappy wife is off the hook. She's still called to obedience, to serving her neighbor and to putting others' needs in front of her own. So it's uh, of limited use, I would say. Yeah, I remember, I think there's actually a line in Ladylike and uh, it says something like, there are a lot of sayings that aren't actually biblical, but they just get said so much that people start to think maybe they are. So <laughs> um, happy wife, happy life is not found in scripture. Another example, I think that from the book was the one that goes, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. And I think we both agreed we can be glad that that's not actually biblical. <laughs> so maybe the same with, you know, in the same way, maybe we can be happy that happy wife, happy life is not biblical um, because then we don't have to have this standard uh, for ourselves or for our marriage that is not actually spoken to us in God's word. And I also think if, uh, especially if a woman is operating and, and you know, that's, that's the basic principle that she's sticking to, I think she could start to attach a sense of entitlement to it, you know, where, whereby she might kind of live or even say, well, if you want to have a good life, keep me happy or make me happy. And this, this wouldn't be a good way to have a, you know, have a dynamic in marriage whereby the, the wife, you know, withholds household joy unless her own happiness, you know, wish list has been met. And we don't want to, we don't want to live that way. We don't want to act that way. And again, it's, it's not what God describes uh, in terms of, of marriage. So we don't, we don't want to fall into that and say, yep, that's the standard, because if it's not God's standard, it, it's just like my sister said, it rhymes. So that's cool. Um, but there are a lot of other words of scripture that speak to marriage that are much more important than those words. That's going to be our rule, that, of course, the standard of scripture to guide us into understanding what he has laid out for women who are married to their husbands and what it means to be a wife. 
But on a show called Friends for Life, where we focus on all sorts of life issues, why would we talk about marriage and why would we talk about what it is to be a wife? Well, marriage is a way of life for most people. It's God's design for for men and women. And it's our society really struggles to speak about generalizations. We always want to run to the exceptions. We're always concerned about the people who feel left out, um, whoever is, you know, having a message forced on them that doesn't apply to them or that even hurts them. Nevertheless, generalizations exist for a reason. And the reality is that most people do spend a good chunk of their life married and it is doing well by marriage is something that Christians have a duty to think about and to develop. So yeah, it does make sense. I've said before, marriage is for everyone. And I don't mean that everyone is married. I don't even mean that everyone should be married. Um, Some are celibate, and God's word extols this, and Christians hold this in high regard. Or some had the gift of marriage and no longer have it due to death or divorce. So I'm not saying everyone is married. I'm not saying everyone should be married. But I would say uh, marriage is for everyone because marriage is for everyone's good, which is why it was part of you know, the the sequence of, of God's creative work was putting together a man and, and a woman, not just for the good of the man, not just for the good of the woman, but for the good of both of them together and for the good of the whole creation that would come to be uh, according to his design and love. So, you know, when we talk about life issues, we should always be paying attention to the fact that God works through means. And and if you're going to say, well, what's a what's one of the means by which God protects and preserves life? You would absolutely want to comment upon marriage and family and that being a very important place where life is is defended and celebrated. That is one of the ways God set all of us together to to work together, to care for one another and really to to be protecting and, and preserving life within creation within, again, that that beautiful gift of marriage and family. So there you have it, listener. If you're wondering why you've clicked on this particular episode because you are not a wife, well, Rosie just answered why this is still a good episode for you to listen to. Uh, Marriage is for everyone's good, and it's a means by which God communicates his love and gives good gifts. Can you briefly define vocation? It's such a big part of your book, but of course it also applies to our conversation in terms of what it is to be a wife. When God gives someone a vocation, what is he giving them? I guess I'll just keep talking first, since my precedence is historically proven. (laughs) Vocation, of course, is just the Latin word for calling. Um, I think most Lutherans are probably familiar with that. It's one of our favorite things. The problem with vocation, as we understand it now, is that we've so conflated it with work, by which I don't mean force times distance, but a career. The thing you get paid money for is what we think of as your work. Then we map that back onto the idea of vocation. So my vocation is the thing I get paid for. And this, there are so many weird ideas that go into this, and uh, we don't need to get excessively philosophical here, I think. But because we do want to be able to tell what is a vocation and what isn't, I think a good test for that is to say that a vocation is something you cannot morally quit doing. If someone else gets hurt because you quit performing some set of functions and duties, then that was your vocation and you shouldn't have quit it. (laughs) If there are places in your life where you are free to change the way you spend your time, change the place you spend your time, things that you can change and it doesn't hurt somebody else, that's where you're free. So vocation is something you're not free to quit doing. It's a, a way and a place God has given you to serve your neighbor that that neighbor needs so much that you have to keep doing it to be a faithful Christian person. So that's a pretty convoluted definition, <laughs> really more of a, a set of, of diagnostics. But I think that vocation has gotten complicated to talk about um, in our time because of our idea of what work is and what station is, 
that I want to be able to really check what my vocation is. If somebody else gets hurt because I, I say, I don't want to do that anymore, then I think there's a, a pretty good chance that's actually a vocational duty that I have that I am not free to walk away from. And now if I am understanding what you're saying, Rebecca, a vocation is a station in which God has put us and a means in which we serve our neighbor and our neighbor is served by us or other people around us. And so being a wife is a vocation because God has given us in marriage to a husband and what God has joined together, let not man separate. Right. I think the idea that, you know, your vocation is what you love doing, it's your passion, is just really not right. Um, because all of us are inclined to like things or to, and then for that reason, to want to prioritize things that are not primarily in service to our neighbor. Of course, pretty much anything you can, you do can be spun <laughs> into some sort of service to some neighbor or other. But there are a lot of considerations there. You have to consider who are my closest neighbors? What are their most immediate needs? Who else is going to be picking up slack if I fail to do this task or if I fail to be in that place? Am I being fair to everyone involved? These are all questions that go into knowing what your vocation is, understanding where your duties lie, understanding here I'm serving my neighbor Here I'm really kind of serving myself and knowing that as a Christian, my duty is always, first of all, to the name of our Lord and second to the people that he has given us to be cared for. And that applies to everyone, not just women, but it is played out differently in the life of each person according to their own variables. Specifically wife. What is a wife's calling to her husband? Well, to continue the line of thought there started by Rebecca, I definitely think that her emphasis on looking carefully at those neighbors that are nearest is is a very, very important place to not only start, but continually return to. And I think that fits with, you know, the question regarding vocation and also what it means to be a wife, Um, because you can think of all the different things you might enjoy enjoy doing in life, some of those likes that she was describing. But you would also recognize that ultimately you could set some of those aside and it would be all right because they could be done by other people. So, you know, whether it's producing a podcast, which is great and hopefully fun for you, Steph, or teaching an online deaconess class, which is really fun for me and I love doing it. But yeah, I also recognize that that there's nothing about me doing that specifically that that couldn't be done well by someone else. And I just understand that. And so if for whatever reason I wasn't able to continue in that role, I know it would be okay because someone else could teach that deaconess class and we would all agree that it would be fine. Whereas when you're talking about your nearest neighbors and the callings we have from God with respect to those nearest neighbors in our lives, Everyone understands that there is something singular about those things related to your family, right? And so everyone would agree, before talking about wife, I might mention for those with children, everyone would agree that different people can care for children, but I'm the only person in my children's life who can narrowly be their mother, Right. So so they could have teachers or, or grandmas or babysitters and all kinds of coaches, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful people sharing in their lives. But no one would say that those people are their mom. I'm their mom. Right. And, and that's why I'm listed on all their forms as mom. Right. Whether they're doing a sport or a music thing or a school thing, everyone knows that the mom is the mom. And so there's this this singularity to it that's very, very important and extremely valuable. So then you could consider the same thing with respect to being a wife, that a lot of different people can share in one another's lives, but everyone would agree that only a wife can be the wife to her husband. And this is what is so important about the way that that God designed it, is that it is a one man, one woman arrangement. And so if I could just make it abundantly clear to say there are many, many things that many people can do, but I am the only person who can be the wife to Scott Adel. Those were the promises we made before God and one another and others who were gathered to hear those vows. And so there's this absolute 
you know, particular distinction that no one else could fill in and, and be that person for him. Then when I reflect upon that, I think being a wife is very, very important. I'm the only person in his life who is that person for him. I think that attaches a great sense of importance and meaning and value to what it is to be a wife. Rebecca, I know you've got some additions. Oh, I was just basking in the wisdom. <laughs> I probably heard at least half of that from my sister. So. <laughs> <laughs> if I were going to say anything else, um, going back to your original question, I think, which is um, specifically, what is the vocation of wife? The, it's, it's right there in the beginning. Help. The wife is there to help her husband. Eve is given to Adam to help him. You know, different translations of the Bible bring this across differently. You know, a, a help meet, a helper corresponding to him, someone who is just there to do everything for him that he is not able to do for himself. It's very clear in, in the Genesis account of creation, you know, God makes Adam, he presents to him all the animals and everything is not okay. It's not going to work this way for creation to be the good gift for Adam that God intends for it to be. The creation of Eve is necessary and she is given for the purpose of helping him. That's all it is. That's the pattern. The man is there and he receives the woman as a helper and that's how it works going forward. So the vocation of wife is helping the husband. We even see too with that account from Genesis is that God establishes the order. He creates the order and that man is created first, woman is created second, as my sister is emphasizing, as a help to the man. And then, of course, the order, you know, it just gets all turned around and all messed up. Um, interestingly, you know, people say, well, Eve was, you know, the first one to reject the order. Actually, it's kind of Satan, right? Because Satan, in his approach with his, his temptation that he was going to present, he first rejected the order by going to Eve, by approaching the woman first, because he understood that the man was created first and the woman was created second. And that would have been the godly order. And instead he goes to the woman first. And of course, then, then the woman takes up the conversation and her husband is right there with her, we see in the account. Uh, but even as he is right there with her, he doesn't step in and say, you know, you're really here to help and you're not helping. Um, he just lets the, the fall play out as it does. But this wonderful thing happens is that even with this terrible, sinful disruption of the order, when God addresses it, the first thing he does is get it back on track. Because when he goes to find Adam and Eve after they have eaten the forbidden fruit, he calls to the man first. So even while he's looking for them and needs to address what has happened with this, this disruption or destruction really of the order, he's there to, he's there to restore the order. He doesn't just say, well, I guess now she answers first and he's there in the background going along with it. He calls to the man. And even in the way that he sets up when he communicates how the curses are going to play out, he even communicates them for the good of man and woman being restored to the created order. So for all of us who say, well, it never worked out, you know, with a woman being the helper, God is continually putting the order back together so much that he had to send his own son. That was how much it was needed. But that is how much he loved the way he designed his creation and intended all of this for our good. All of our husbands are pastors, correct? Yes. Yep. So maybe your husbands would agree. My husband's number one um, problem <laughs> when he's doing premarital counseling, and by problem I just mean this always, always seems to rub people the, the wrong way, is when they're, they're going over, of course, the order of creation in, in Genesis, and then in the New Testament, all of the things written about marriage. People don't like the word help or helper, or to be submissive to their husbands. What does it mean then to be a helper in a very biblical sense, not in the way that we would read or understand it in our modern context? All those people just need to read the whole Bible all over again. They should start with the Gospel of John. We have this idea that submission is fundamentally adversarial. That if you say, okay, I'll submit to you. I'm only saying that with my jaw clenched and my heels dug in. But the ultimate model of submission 
is our Lord Jesus Christ, who submits freely, willingly, utterly to the will of the Father because he wants the same thing. He wants us to be reconciled to God. They're not on different teams. So even though we see Jesus in the garden, you know, asking, let this cup pass from me, that doesn't mean I really don't want to do this. I wish you weren't making me do this. I hate it that you're forcing me to do this. It's just a full acknowledgement of the pain that sin causes, which he will drink to the bottom for the good of having us back. So when the wife submits to her husband, following after the manner of our Lord Jesus Christ, she does so by saying, Thy will be done. My will is your will. I want what you want. When a woman chooses a man to marry, which everyone gets to do, the church sees to it that uh, both parties consent. What she is choosing there is the will that she will also make her own. She's just saying, I am on board. Now, this is not to say that there won't be problems, because for sure, that guy's a sinner, and he is going to blow it in some pretty big ways at times, and in little ways all day, every day. What balances that out is that she is also a sinner. (laughs) She is going to blow it in some very big ways sometimes, and in little ways all day, every day. So this idea that to submit to one's husband and to follow his will is this big problem we have to deal with is just completely wrong-headed and anti-Christian. It is not listening to what our Lord himself says. It is not looking at what this perfect ideal of obedience looks like. It is being unwilling and rebellious. And so, of course, that's why we don't like it, why women don't like it, because uh, we're sinful, and that's a, a, a really fantastic sin. It's so easy to commit, and it applies specifically to us. Because of that, it looks not fair. We always want to look at what's not fair to us. We don't take any account for what's not fair to the guys. In some ways, I think we, we, we're not even really sure. We don't have the mind for it. We're not there. In the same way that they don't get it, you know, they can look at this arrangement and say, this makes sense, right? Also, God said it. Like, what's the big deal, right? Uh, they have trouble seeing into our minds in the same way. Uh, but that's that's a, a failure of intellect, not necessarily, uh, you know, we we make it then into a failure of morality. I, I think this uh, this idea that submission is this is this terrible burden that just builds conflict into a marriage is only true because we're dealing with a sinful husband and a sinful wife. And the prevailing idea that submission is bad because it always, you know, ends in some kind of abuse Uh, doesn't take into account the sinful wife, honestly. We're very willing to talk about what big bad sinners' husbands are, but we never want to factor in uh, (laughs) the sin that the wife returns in kind. And um, we imagine that 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 unbalances this good setup that the Lord has given us. Corrupted even as it is by sin, it's corrupted equally. I recommend another reading of the Gospel of John and keeping in mind that God describes himself as a helper. This is so silly, you know, to imagine that there's something demeaning or disrespectable about help. And it's also (laughs) disingenuous because women are always saying, oh, I just want to help. I just want to help people. What can we do to help? This person needs help. Women are always calling for help. Uh, both as, as, as givers and as receivers. So this, this whole thing is, is bogus and trumped up and not being honest with what the real problem is. And it's just that we don't want to hear. This is what God has arranged. He's arranged it in his wisdom for your good. And it is the right way. And sometimes it's going to be hard and you have to do it anyway. Sometimes your husband is going to make a bad call and you're going to have to go along. Sometimes he's going to outright sin and you will have to forgive him and make the best of it. We don't want any of that. The only way out of that is repentance. 
Good work, sister. Uh, I love it when you get into it like that. That's good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Way to give it to us. Okay, we needed that. We needed that. Yeah, I mean, this is the other thing I was thinking is that the people who are resistant to um, the the idea of submission, first of all, as was pointed out, that they're being resistant to the word of God, you know? And so this is the thing, if people are upset with the pastor or upset with the church or upset with ever what whatever Christian happened to have said something about a wife being submissive to her husband, is that ultimately that person, if they walked the whole thing back, would see that it was God's word, right? It, before it was anyone else who upset them on the matter. Um, so First of all, I would say, okay, some of those things uh, maybe need to be worked out with God uh, rather than, you know, lashing out at whether it's, again, a pastor or another fellow believer who is speaking in this way. We're, we're speaking with the, the very words of scripture when we talk about a wife submitting to her husband. The other thing is, I do think that something when it comes to wifely submission, something I can just admit to myself is that it it doesn't sound too bad until we're actually in a position where we disagree with what's being called upon for us to do. And so we can say like, yeah, you know, I'm fine with a lot of the decisions that my husband has made and I'm right there with him cheering him on. And that works out fine until there's something where there is a point of significant disagreement. And then it's in those moments where suddenly this all comes rushing at us and it's very overwhelming and very unpleasant because if we really take God at his word that in those moments, the, the wife was not created for headship in those moments, but to be a help. And we have to accept that. That is when it's hard. So I think this is one of those things that especially for maybe earlier on, um, whether someone's engaged or anticipating the joys of marriage, it might be easier to say yes to that. And then when you find yourself in the thick of it, it's like, ooh, yes to that. That's actually going to be harder than I realized. Um, but in such times, we can think about the fact that, you know, we have this image of Christ and, and the church and, and what we have in marriage. And this is right there in the, the marriage right, that this is so important for the, for the sake of understanding this image of Christ and the church. And we do understand that that Christ and his love for the church, it was a sacrificial love. It was a giving love. And this is what the husband is called to, this sacrificial love, this giving love. You know, ultimately a, a godly husband would say he would be willing to sacrifice his, even his life for his wife. Um, I, I can think of a lot of godly husbands who would say that. Wives, on the other hand, maybe a wife would say she'd be willing to give up her life for her husband, but probably uh, a husband would try to make it go the other direction if at all possible. But maybe a wife is not called to die a bodily death for the sake of her husband, but just to die to self. And that is hard in its own way is to say, I'm not in charge. And in those little moments where we die to self are going to be what contribute to who we are as the one helping our husband and saying ultimately that each negotiation and each challenging moment of the marriage, I'm going to see the marriage as um, something bigger than my own wants or my own hopes for whatever whatever is going on in the marriage that's this cause of, you know, whether you want to call it, you know, disagreement or conflict or something along those lines. But recognizing that whatever our our behavior and our speech in those moments, if we we ask God to help us, that we would be speaking and acting in a way that is ultimately for the good of the marriage rather than for our own personal good. He will help us and he has promised to send his spirit. So when we can't muster that for ourselves, we have his help in those times. See, he's going to help. God helps. God helps. We'll be above helping. Not, Not all bad. <laughs> exactly. That's right. The spirit himself is the helper that was given to us as well. And so as you had Gospel said. Gospel John again. God, it yeah, is. Go back to John. God, <laughs> God himself identifies as a helper. And so that's not a derogatory term. It's not a term that we need to be afraid of, even as modern women, quote unquote. And Rosie, as you said, marriage, so to be a wife and to be a husband, it's a reflection of Christ and his bride, the church, not the other way around. But in fact, marriage, human marriage is a reflection of the truest marriage that is Christ who joined himself to 
the church to his people. And we will look forward to the wedding feast that is to come when Christ returns. But what you're saying is to be faithful in the vocation of wife is to be living out the gospel in a very real sense. This is important because people are watching. Most obvious are children if we're blessed with them. And so we speak for God in the way that we live and carry out this specific vocation. You both have referenced the fall. How has the fall specifically affected the duties of a wife? What are the consequences of the fall into sin for the wife specifically? You know, sin just corrupts everything. So I think there's, you know, not a necessarily a specific set of wife sins. There are just person sins. And if you're a wife, you're going to be sinning <laughs> in the office of wife. So the way that plays out is, I think, very culture bound and situationally bound in any individual household, of course. And it has a lot to do with personality, too. Everyone is tempted to different things. Everyone has different opportunities to sin that they are more or less drawn to. And then there are things that we're all, you know, washed toward or away from just based on, you know, where and when we live. Certainly in our time um, living in the post-feminist era, we're very much drawn toward these ideas that, like Rosie said, you know, being, being a wife means dying to yourself. We're positively told that is bad. You should not sacrifice for others. You should not put other people's needs and interests ahead of your own. You should not immolate yourself on the altar of other people, especially your horrible husband and your needy, demanding children and all these people who are sucking your glorious personality out of your body. This idea that your ultimate faithfulness is to yourself However you define yourself to be, however you identify is just an absolute lie and deception and temptation that will tear apart any family it can get its hands on. It is simply the opposite of what we see God calling wives to certainly. But again, like we've said throughout, like he calls everyone to, he calls all of us to sacrifice uh, out of faithfulness to our baptismal vows um, in order to live under his law to the extent that we are able, under a, a repentant and contrite state of mind and heart, and sacrifice for the neighbors he's given us <laughs> in order, our husband and children and our extended family and neighbors, our church family and our communities. I think that is where we see women tempted most today is being told, yeah, forget all of that. Do what you want. Do what makes you happy. Tell yourself whatever lies you want that make you happy. And we just have to be aware of that and have to be on guard against it. And the, the weapon we have is the word of God and knowing it and submitting to it and receiving in humility what the Lord teaches us about being faithful to his name and serving our neighbors. Yeah, we see even at the very moment of the fall that, you know, the the thing that tempted Eve was that it was pleasing to the eye. And so we're continually tempted by that which pleases us or that which we imagine would please us. And so we become very wrapped up with that self-centered quest of, you know, achieving or obtaining and then holding on to whatever pleases us. It's, of course, not at all in line with the call to love one another. And so the consequences of the fall, you know, kind of as my sister said, are just all over the place. They're, they're affecting absolutely everything. And, and another thing I would point out is that even before the fall, there was work. So work was a good thing. And before the fall, there was order and order was a good thing. And both of those things were then corrupted as a result of, of human sin. But yet in our daily life, we see the side of that that is corrupted by sin, but we also see that those things are still good. The order is still good. 
even if you just take the piece of food, right, that's at the center of the fall, the food is still good, right? God doesn't ball up the whole operation and throw it in the trash and be like, okay, well, you know, the created order didn't work and food didn't work and work didn't work and we're getting rid of all of it. No, he comes to put everything back in place and everything back in order. So for all of us who are living here with all of the painful consequences of the fall and the attacks of the devil, the world, and the sinful nature, we also recognize the point is not just to throw it all in the trash. The point is to still recognize what about those things are good for us individually and as a whole creation, and to strive with the help of God to be a part of that creation where God placed us and recognizing the goodness of it for ourselves and for our neighbors. So even if you're looking at something like some aspect of being a wife, like the work that's involved with it, you know, we can in our own minds recognize that work is a good thing. And I think we've we've kind of drifted from that and kind of gotten into this point of like, the, the work will never be done. And there is a side of work that you know, is corrupted by the fall. So we might kind of regard that as toil, right? Like the the sweat of our brow kind of stuff. But work is still good and, and working at marriage is good. So we resist thinking that it's somehow all, you know, wrapped up in that big thing that goes in the trash, but rather that we see, no, even the work of being a wife is good for us. It's good for our husband and it's good for all of God's creation for us to continue to work at it again, with with right regard for it and recognize that though we cannot, you know, we can't ever put in one perfect workday as a wife or as anyone, we still aim to lead godly lives. And we do so through our prayers and through our reading of scripture and through receiving God's gifts that he has for us. And all of those things contribute to that work of wife in a way that that makes it valuable and important and worthwhile. Despite the fact that sin corrupts and reaches everything and the fact that at the end of the day, we look back and we have not been up to the task of being perfect wife on any given day, what are the blessings of living according to God's design with the help of God faithfully? What are the blessings that God gives to a man and to a woman, to their families as those vocations are lived out according to God's design? I think this just kind of falls under seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. If you live in accordance with the order, your life will be more orderly (laughs) and you will have, you know, fewer difficulties and complications. So maybe we should consult the Proverbs here also. A gentle answer that turns away wrath. If you are going through your life as a prickly person who resists and shoots back and takes things the wrong way and employs a hermeneutic of mistrust toward the people around you, yeah, you're going to have a harder time. And if you are doing that on a larger scale, if you are resisting the will of God as he reveals it in his word, if you are being disobedient to his commands for us and the good gifts that he gives us in the guidance of his law, yeah, you're going to have big problems. So you get to decide. You get to choose your pain. You can choose the pain of discipline and living as a Christian to the extent that you can, being in a constant state of humility and repentance, being receptive to the conviction of the law, as well as you can, recognizing your sins for what they are, confessing them, turning away from them. Uh, and this is a daily process. I don't mean to make it sound here like every day you're going to get a little bit better and better and better. You're not. It's it's a circle. Every day the old Adam needs to drown and the new man needs to emerge and arise. But there are still some helpful tips <laughs> for going along the way. Be the gentle answer. Mm-hmm know God's word, know what obedience to that looks like. And so far as you are able, live in compliance with that. Yeah, there's so much, you know, the longer you spend stewing about the things about marriage that you don't like and that you wish weren't true, you'll just get deeper and deeper in that stew pot and just set yourself to boil. And and that is not going to be a happy place to live your life from, right? Like, I think this has a lot to do with like what my sister said in terms of discipline. If you just want to spend your your days begrudging what's hard about marriage, 
yeah, there will just be a lot of bitterness and resentment growing inside of you. And guess what? Those things don't feel good (laughs) inside. And not that our primary aim is to feel good, but actually living the lives that God has called us to, there is joy in it. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. When we recognize God at work in us, growing those fruits in us, not that we regard the fruits of the Spirit as like the best self-help guide, but that we pray for those things and we pray for them in abundance and that we recognize that the Lord at work in our lives, growing those things in us, whether it's love for our husbands or joy in our marriage or peace and patience in our in our households, those are all things that when God is at work in us, growing those things in us, they are good for us. They are healthy for us. And also, as we all know, a tree doesn't eat its own fruit. They are things by which our nearest neighbors are nourished. That when we're having those things grown in us, they're good for us and for those around us who are being filled up with those same wonderful gifts of the Spirit. And so these are the things that when, you know, if someone is, you know, looking at ways, you know, if you're just sitting there like, well, I wonder how I can improve this marriage. I would just pray for more of the Lord at work in your individual life because it will bear good fruit for you and for those near you. And to see that so much of what he has to offer us through scripture is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. This is what he has for us. These are wonderful things of great joy for us. And to recognize those things are for us and for our marriage, you know, talking about forgiveness of sins, that has to be at the center of every day of married life is thanking God that we're forgiven in Christ and being merciful as our father in heaven is merciful, responding with grace for our spouse and also thanking him for the times that he forgives us as, as the wife who has failed. So when we have all of those things in the center and at the heart of of what we're thinking on and and praying for, that is a lot better than that that nasty stew pot of trying to chip away at all the deep unhappinesses of marriage. I I don't want to sit in that stew. There's a better place for us as wives. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. I'm a very practical black and white person. So I'm tempted to ask for things to do specifically, just as you said. How can I, in day to day, be a better wife? Are you saying, well, there's not really one or two things I can give you. Are you just essentially being like, read the gospels, figure out what God has called you to do or who your nearest neighbors are and do that. Read the gospels, figure out what God is calling you to do in your marriage and do it. And that involves a constant cycle of asking for forgiveness and receiving absolution and dying to self. I mean, Are there things you can just tell us (laughs) to do to be better? I think you need all that stuff. Yes. You need to have, have the mind of a Christian, certainly. And that necessarily means that you are in the word constantly, that you are receiving the Lord's gifts of word and sacrament in his house very regularly, often. But for, for any individual, we need practical feedback also, that's tricky to come by. I mean, you can certainly walk up to your husband and say, what What? what do you recommend for me as a wife? Husbands don't like that. <laughs> it's real awkward for everybody. Uh, of course, as soon as he says what he really thinks, you're going to be mad at him. Uh, there's There are many difficulties. But I think one very useful piece of advice that I've heard a lot of places is have a mentor, have several. And that can be someone that you go directly to and say, what do I need to know? What can I be improving on here? And that also, I think you need people who can do that for you personally, who know you very well. And you can also do that for people who are able to speak generally to the question of what does a good wife look like? And I think you should also seek out models where you can say, I know this friend of mine is really good at dealing with her husband when they have a situation like this. What would she be doing right now if she were me? Could I try that (laughs) instead of doing the thing that my angry, selfish, suspicious heart is inclined to do. Have a lot of examples because there's no one person who does everything perfectly, but I bet you can think of a lot of women you know who do this thing right, do that thing right, where you've watched them interact with their children or husband and you can say, whoa, that was, that really worked. That was so smart. Why, why would not my brain never have arrived there? So look for advice, look for models, 
um, and look for principles. You, you need to be doing all those things at the same time. Yeah, we've talked a lot about, you know, the help we have from the Lord and his word, but we also talked about God working through means and another mean by which he works is is through the faithful, sharing, teaching one another. And something that I have found very helpful when you are asking stuff about like, are there specific things that could help me as a wife is I, I think it's great to read. Uh, read on the subject of Christian marriage. And so I do a lot of reading on that subject. And it's not that I necessarily see how it all applies individually, but if it if it makes sense generally, there's probably something there that I could apply specifically in, in our marriage, in our home. There's a LCMS pastor. He's also a counselor. His name is Dr. Randy Schrader, and he has generated a lot of wonderful godly help um, with respect to Christian marriage in particular. And there are concrete, specific things that he has shared that I have returned to and thought, yeah, good one. Yes to that. You know, like just this morning, I was thinking about some of the different things that I've read in his writing and one of his daily essential habits for a happy, uh, content, a blessed marriage is that in the first five minutes of interaction, there should be nothing negative. That's just one very small thing that like even this morning, I woke up and I knew, Steph, that Rebecca and I were going to be talking with you on this subject. I thought I could share one of those wonderful things I had learned from him because he is a good, faithful pastor and he's, he's sharing good, faithful help for Christian marriage. And his thing about nothing negative in the first five minutes is just like this very concrete challenge, you know, that if you wake up, and you say, in my first five minutes of interacting with my spouse, it'll be nothing negative. It won't be a complaint. It won't be a criticism. None of that. Um, that's a good, you know, it's like, hey, that's something I could work on. And it could be a specific thing I work on. And it could be really good. Or in the first five minutes of me getting home after being gone or my husband getting home after being gone. And, you know, he just describes how it develops a good, positive interaction for moving forward. And so I think there are a lot of good helps for all of us. You could go online and read any number of wonderful sermons written on marriage and be strengthened by God's word through faithful preaching in that way. So, of course, we want to think specifically uh, daily about who we are as a baptized child of God and what that means for us and also how that looks in our marriage. And then also beyond that, there are great things we can learn from the people around us. There are great things we can learn from people when it comes to marriage, whether it's something specific that's troubling us um, or challenging us or just general good principles and, and daily habits. There's a lot of good stuff out there. I might add to that challenge that in addition to taking five minutes before, of course, you would ever consider saying anything negative, would also be to drink your coffee. There you go. Before. <laughs> Do your best to be properly <laughs> fed, watered, and rested. I know that yes. is really hard when you have little people around, but it makes such a big difference. It's vital. Yeah. In wrapping up here, I'm learning from you because you've been in your marriages longer than I have. I'm learning through you right now and then also through your book that you worked on together. So to the younger brides, to the younger wives who are listening, what do you wish you knew when you were first married about being a wife that you would advise, uh, encourage, admonish younger wives to know so they don't have to learn it the hard way like maybe you did? Well, I've got two things and they're deeply practical. So you'll like this stuff. The first is uh, hope you like housework, which sounds so silly. But, you know, I think that <laughs> childhood is such that mom and dad do so much more work than you knew. And then when you're the grownups, you're like, oh, shoot, this place is a mess. Wait, <laughs> we have to like read the mail, especially since I got married right out of college. I had never had an adult life on my own, which is not unusual necessarily. But, you know, since since I was also throwing marriage into the mix there, it all kind of went together for me. At a very practical level, marriage just demands that you grow up and do grown up jobs. And I, I do mean just around the house. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, secondly, I would say, you know, this is something that it's, since I'm really an old lady now, I feel a lot more comfortable than I did at the beginning. But um, I think, and uh, this is something I've heard from other people also, I think most people underestimate 
the effect of your in-laws on your life when you get married. Um, you know, when you get married, you don't know them very well. There's a good chance you, you get along pretty well. You know, you have a good time when, when you're at their house and they're nice to you and you're nice to them and everybody's just kind of pals. But as, as life goes on, and, uh, and again, especially when once there start being kids in the mix, if that's God's will, you start to see, oh, we, we are just together forever. <laughs> Same way my husband and I are. And we are really different. And figuring that out is something that will be as difficult as you make that. I, I don't mean to say that you know, it's this terrible uphill battle, but it's just something you have to get used to and get comfortable with and have fully incorporated into your life that it's pretty hard to understand before marriage, I think. I think a lot of people go into marriage just kind of thinking of your in-laws as another set of friends. And that is is not <laughs> a full understanding of that relationship. And obviously you want that to be a good relationship. So that means that you have to be uh, very open and understanding. It just takes a while to figure out. Living with a man is the same way. Truly becoming family to your husband's family, and of course him with, with your family as well, is a process and you're doing it. It's something you only do once and you figure it out over the course of your life. And there are going to be misunderstandings along the way. And dealing with those is you know, something you can do well or not so well. And there are going to be a lot of really good things along the way too, if you are, again, open to that. It's a skill set, I think, that you can only learn by doing. Um, so again, I don't want, you know, so often when people talk about in-laws, it's just implicitly negative. And I don't mean that at all. I just mean it's tricky and not something you can really practice for. Well, I'm just thinking of when I first started dating my husband, I would make him food all the time and I sent him brownies home really early on. And I, you know what? In retrospect, I should have sent brownies home, not for him, but for my future in-laws, just not knowing at the time that they were going to be my in-laws. And so uh, remember that in-laws like food too, you know, so it doesn't hurt to make them brownies or pie, right? Right. <laughs> Win them over that way. In-laws like food too. That's the quotable quote. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good one. <laughs> so funny. I think if I were thinking back on things to say, you know, to someone who's just, ex you know, anticipating married life, the first thing I would say is that, you know, there will be things that you find out about your husband as you live together and, maybe marriage will be that time that you recognize you don't think they're all cute, right? So like in dating uh, or even in engagements, like everything is cute or everything is sweet or isn't that adorable. And then when you realize that you're going to be living together as man and wife for as long as you both shall live, then you start to observe some things that could be really irritating. Or, and you could even be surprised that you're irritated by them. And I, you know, when I think about our, our first just months of marriage early on, I just remember thinking like, uh, why am I so annoyed all the time? <laughs> why am I getting so annoyed by things that really are small? And I've talked to others as well who've said the same thing. Like someone was saying how much like, she couldn't stand the the sound of her husband's chewing or something like this. Like really small things can just get under our skin. I think a great help for this is just to, you know, sometimes I would be like, I wonder what's annoying about me, you know, because there's probably a whole <laughs> list of things like I probably chew loudly for all I know. I have little daily habits too that are not that sweet or that cute. And so maybe we can, you know, just kind of, get a, a sense of perspective in those things and recognize that even if we don't find everything he is doing to be cute, likewise, he probably does not find us continually cute either. And, and to recognize that we're a part of something far bigger than that when we enter into marriage. So even in daily irritations, we can see them as, as small because they are, they truly are. They're, they're not going to be 
you know, we should never let them be the thing that sours marriage for us because they're minor. They're they're small daily things. And with time, the funny thing is you can almost circle back to finding them cute with time. Like later on, you'd be like, oh, like, I love that little foible of his, you know? And so maybe just give yourself a little time. Maybe later you'll be like, I love it when he chomps so loudly away at that apple <laughs> um, or whatever it may be. So, you know, just get there on, on whatever timeline you have to work with for that. Um, but then the other thing, and I remember this being something, um, you know, on a more serious note, when we were going through our premarital counseling, when my husband, well, before he was my husband, when Scott and I were going through premarital counseling, something that our pastor said to us, and at first we thought he was being theoretical, but as it played out, we recognized he's like, no, he's saying this now. We're supposed to do this now. He said, uh, practice saying, please forgive me. I forgive you. And we both looked at each other and nodded like, yeah, that's good. And he goes, no, say it, say it. I'm telling you to practice saying it. And we go, oh, you mean now? Yes, he meant right there. He wanted us to practice saying the words out loud. Please forgive me. I forgive you. And he said, I'm having you practice it here in a very easy setting because you are going to have to say those words to each other continually for as long as you are married. So let's get going with it right here before you're even married, practicing those words. Please forgive me. I forgive you. And that really is at the heart of Christian marriage is being forgiven by Christ, being loved by Christ, and because of Christ being called to love and forgive one another. That goes for marriage. That goes for Christian life as well. Absolutely. Forgive me. I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for those wise words. Thank you for just your collective wisdom in sharing today. Before we wrap up, can you just tell us where we can find your book for those who don't have it in their hands yet, which you need to have in your hands? You can pick that up at cph.org. The title of the book is Ladylike. So just buy a whole lot of stuff at CPH and I think you'll eventually get free shipping. That's right. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rosie, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you this for having great. us. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. 